Welcome to our session for the Oxford World English Symposium 2022. I am Dr. Celeste Rodriguez Luro, and I am here with my research associate, Nyunga Scholar Glenny Scholard. We are speaking to you from the University of Western Australia. Before commencing, we would like to acknowledge the Nyunga people who are the owners of the still unceded lands in which we live and work. We pay our respects to their elders, leaders and communities. This has always been and will always be Aboriginal land. Thank you for that acknowledgement. So let's... Hi, I'm, I'm Glenis Collard and yeah, looking forward to having a yarn with you. Yes, wonderful. So today we will be sharing with you some insights into Australian Aboriginal English, an English lexified, contact-based variety of English spoken by approximately 80% of First Nations people in Australia. Aboriginal English is used for distinctive speech acts, speech events and genres. We will be referring to Australian Aboriginal English as AAE on the slides and as Aboriginal English in our oral presentation of the material. We will use both academic English uh, in the presentation as well as a bit of Aboriginal English yarning uh, through the contributions of uh, Glennis Collets uh, as we go. Aboriginal English sits in a continuum from light to heavier varieties. The light varieties are close to standardised Australian English the heavier varieties are closer to Creole, a post-invasion contact language spoken by First Nations people in Northern Australia. Lighter or acrolectal Aboriginal English is superficially similar to standardised Australian English. And because of this similarity, many Aboriginal English speakers are seen as speaking broken English which is, of course, a completely mistaken view and indeed a very big problem for speakers of Aboriginal English. What do you think, it Glenn? Is, it's broken, bad, simple, basic. We have all these tags have been put on our speech and as an Aboriginal English speaker mm. myself, um, that doesn't make me feel good because it's what I know, it's who I am, and it's who my family are, and it's we'll continue to share some more with you. So Yes, yes, thank you so much. Yes, yes we'll have another couple of slides where we'll discuss this. Yeah. Um now a key notion arising from the research that uh Glennis Collard and I have been doing together since 2018 is that of yarning, yarning. And um, the speakers we interacted with, and Glennis will be telling you a little yarn about who we um, spoke to in the process of collecting um, our data, were um, all connecting with us and with Glennis specifically through yarning. So yarning is an indigenous cultural form of storytelling and conversation. It's been defined as a process of making meaning, communicating, and very, very importantly, passing on history and knowledge. So an extremely culturally entrenched practice across Aboriginal Australia in our particular research, this is a practice we used in sociolinguistic research um, that we conducted in Nyunga country in southwest Western Australia. Yeah. And, and, and something that we wanted to mention uh, before Glennis tells you more about the wonderful people we were lucky to um, yarn with is that when we approached 
all of these people. And when we were collecting the corpus of materials that we will be um, uh, sharing with you in in a little in a little while, um, we actually did not have any predetermined questions, any sociolinguistic interview questions, or any focus group questions. We basically just used yarning, and that's what that was very important for you, Glennis. Yeah, I said to Celeste, we need to go, I want to take you to our place, our spaces where my people are. They're not waiting for 10 o'clock for us to arrive. We will just turn up and we will have a yarn because a lot of research we've done and it's already in a setting outside of home or a place that we can call ours, even if it's in the park, it's still our park. We will say it's our park, uh, our place, our camp, wherever. So Celeste was very brave to do this with me and I said, I told her, trust me, it's something that will bring out a whole another variety range of what information we can get from our speakers yes and and it did and we actually reflected on this and there's a publication that some of you may be interested in chasing up which uh, came out last year in journal of sociolinguistics it's called working together so you can read more about our wonderful experience together then um but what we wanted to share with you specifically today is that the process of collecting the materials was led by Glennis, Glennis Collard, and we had three key pillars, three key um, sort of guiding principles in collecting the data uh, in this community. Number one, the data originate from group recording sessions, and this is culturally appropriate in their community. So you will, you, you will have seen in the photos that we shared with you that there were um, maybe two, three, four, up to nine speakers in a single um, in a single recording session, and that was just culturally appropriate. Um, we recruited speakers across a number of different venues, including medical centres, not the centres themselves, but the sort of outside of those centres where we could find uh, people who were um, ready to sit down and have a yarn. And all of this uh, took place in the metropolitan Perth area. And as we said before, the data collection that we um, used, the methodology we used was based on yarning which is a way of communicating and passing on history and knowledge. So what we really like about our approach is that it is strongly grounded in Indigenous knowledge sharing practices. So we wanted to share this with you because although we are presenting or referring to specific, we'll be referring to specific um, linguistic features of Aboriginal English, we believe that the way that we secured the materials, um, including the use of Indigenous knowledge sharing practices, is actually as important as the linguistic features we're going to be sharing with you. Definitely. Um, definitely. So did definitely. you want to add anything in that respect? It's or? culturally safe space. It's in our space. It's not in a predetermined space of time in, like the medical centre. No, we didn't go into the medical centre. Just had a yarn outside before even going in, to, not into, around to the next area where a lot of people sit. And as we did, as our people did many years ago, and you know, you can sit alongside, you know, not across to talk, you sit alongside. Yes. And, and you just began. knew exactly what to do because you're a member of yes. this community in addition to being a researcher. So, so we emphasise methodology and methodological innovation uh, and we've done it in our own publications and work that we're doing at the moment because we believe that it can take us just a step 
closer to maybe decolonizing some of the ways that we've been um, gathering information uh, from communities, gathering data with communities, um, so that we might approach the whole enterprise a bit differently. So we'll leave you with that. We wanted to share with you um, one of the many yarning sessions that we recorded in the Southern Hemisphere winter of 2019. Here you can see Glenny Scollard on the left, yarning with three women in her extended family. And of course, all of the data um, that we are sharing with you today here are shared with permission. And it wasn't organized beforehand. It just happened. It literally was one of those things that just happened. So I said, Celeste, we don't have to go anywhere. I should, we should see some people in about 10 minutes are going to come here. So it was a, always at the just, ready for an opportunity. Happened. That's it. Yes. So let's have a listen. And she comes pushing it in with all the pros. She's like, hi, darling. How are you going? Thanks, let, thanks for letting me in your house. And pushes the white girl and says, get out of my way. And walks in the kitchen. And she's like, I'm making a feed. I don't care. And I walked out. She reckons, see, that's my niece there. She's black. I'm allowed in this house. And I, oh, wow. And I looked at her. Yeah, boy. And I looked at her. I was like, Arnie, um, <laughs> just for respect. Yeah. I was like, Arnie, you can't come here doing that there. I was like, can't, aren't you going to take your stuff and go to your family's house or somewhere else. And she was like, oh, no, Pop, I'm just cooking the chop. I'm hungry. I'm, I'll be quick and I'll, I'll get out. And I was like, no, nah, you don't touch nothing. Wait there. I was like, she can do it for you because she let you in. And then she's like, I don't, I don't like why people touch my food. They might poison it, Bob. And, you know, <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, this is. As you can see from the example we just played for you, our corpus contains many Aboriginal English features. You can see phonological features in purple, morphosyntactic features in light orange, semantic features in yellow. The corpus also contains Nyunga terms such as boya, which means money, money. and yoga, which means women. We will be discussing some of these with you today. Many of these features are, of course, attested in other varieties of English, but when used by speakers who are ancestrally and culturally Aboriginal, we're in the presence of Aboriginal English. So let's have a look at some phonological features of Aboriginal English as spoken in Nyunga Buja, Nyunga country, uh, here in Southwest Western Australia. These observations, as well as the ones on grammar, lexis, semantics, and discourse pragmatics we're about to share with you today, are based on our 2021 Language and Linguistics Compass paper, uh, which you can see referenced on the slide. So let's get started by looking at some phonological features of Aboriginal English. A stereotypical feature of Aboriginal English involves the glottal fricative consonant you can see here, which we shall refer to as H for ease. In Aboriginal English, H is either omitted or added to words. We don't actually have any instances in this particular corpus of H addition. So things like instance rather than instance, we don't actually have any of those. But H omission is actually quite common. This is an example we collected a very difficult yarn about discrimination and racism. Yeah. And again, you know, sharing these kinds of examples may seem uh, insensitive to some, but this is what came up in the data collection and under your leadership we... It was what they chose to talk about. It wasn't prompted by us. It was just, yeah, honey, we just come to have a yarn. Yeah, yeah, you're right, sit down. Yeah, yeah, sit there, pull the chair up or, yeah, we'll sit down with you. Wherever we were, it was about you. It was about our mob 
and who they are who around. they are exactly yeah who, it's identity it's um and i know that as i said i will always go and sit by the side so how are you doing what is up to you fellas doing today no nothing about journey so they'll place me in a category i'm not auntie but i am auntie in the sense of yes, they already yes, know yes. that I'm um, Aboriginal, they're Aboriginal. So that's just our politeness of, yeah, so what are you girls doing? Because Sani can say that, yes. Yeah, and we have these all of these examples here of, of age um, delition. So instead of happy, head, happy or hiding. And as just the examples heard, here, we have... Hungry. She yes. didn't say hungry. She said angry. Angry, exactly. Angry. So angry. you've got all she of these. Angry. Uh huh. And that, if you yes. listen to the video we just played, so the girl on the end. Is, yes. Is yes. Says, because she was angry. There you go. So that's angry. quite a. That's why we said it's a stereotypical feature of Aboriginal English, and and historically, and historically, it's also related to the loss of initial age. Um, uh, or this loss of initial age is linked to the absence of fricative consonants in ancestral Aboriginal languages. And so that's uh, that's something that's been talked about in the literature before. So still um, at the level of phonology, we find that in line with what's been described for African-American vernacular English, Aboriginal English speakers uh, metathesize K and S in the word ask which is pronounced Aspers. which is <laughs> pronounced asks um and we also have th stopping which is common such that words um like they or there are often pronounced as uh day or dare yeah. and that's quite common as well um well all varieties of english include reduced pronunciations of word final ing aboriginal english tends to prefer in rather than ing by default for example in how mm. you pronounce yarning. yarning so yarning yeah. um and um and also in aboriginal english we find uh, that deletion or devoicing of unstressed uh, syllables is quite common so that words such as because or explain are often pronounced as cause, cause explain. or explain. There you go. So those are some of the many features that, um, that, are, that are attested in our corpus. Having a look now at grammatical, some grammatical features of Aboriginal English, multiple negation and demonstrative then are pervasive. So for multiple negation, the example we have here is it never made a noise, it never done nothing. And for demonstrative them, um, we have uh, can't get on them things rather than you know, something like on those things or the <laughs> things. Yeah. And, and I have to say that that's quite prominent as well in a corpus. Um, leveled was is also pervasive in our materials, exemplified here in you was in the stolen generation, as you can see on the slide. Uh, the verb phrase is a notable site for linguistic innovation in Aboriginal English, with inflections, auxiliaries, and copulas operating distinctively. For example, the perfect aspect is expressed in the absence of auxiliary have, and the example you can see here is most of our family been in that rather than, than, than maybe have been in that. And this, again, is with reference to stolen generations, which as many of you probably know was a very sad moment in Australian history when First Nations babies and children were taken away from their families. Um, we also see an example in When We Seen Her, and that again is another instance where the participle seen appears in the absence of the auxiliary verb um, have. 
So moving on to Lexis and semantics, as we were sort of referring to before, the corpus, our corpus, includes many um, Nyunga lexemes. So lexemes, words that originate from the Nyunga language, which is the ancestral, the original, the traditional language of Southwest Western Australia, in which uh, you, Glennies, had a lot to do with um, documenting and teaching, right, the, throughout your life. Yes, I collected the, I did the first collection of Nyunga language in the 80s, later 80s. Uh, that's, of course, what got me into Aboriginal English because the elders at the time were yarnan, 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 and then I'm going, no, you can't throw that out because we were looking only for Nyunga. And I was going, oh, yes, there's Nyunga, Nyunga. Aboriginal English, Aboriginal English, as it was like. So it was so had, mixed, yeah? You had yeah, the Nyunga was, language mixed in with yeah, the Aboriginal all, English. Yeah, it was so... And it, in, you couldn't in, intertwine, intertwine, you could not yeah. um, separate it really. But what we had to do for the traditional language was only to take the word and it was like, no, you can't because it's out of the context. But and it, it, in a way, this is interesting because we were after Aboriginal English here, but of course, the corpus is full yes. of Nyunga words such as dadi to mean the best, good looking, good. the best, good, good looking, um, yeah. kadi to mean kadi. someone not, right, not, in the not right in the head, uh, maya maya to mean a house, a house camp. A camp. Um, a place where one lives, uh, boya, which I think we mentioned before to mean money. money. And then there's really, I love this one, yog and, and yoga, so women and women, which um, then get reanalyzed in English and you get a, a neologism, you get <laughs> a yoga to mean a woman in Aboriginal English, and then you add the S and you get yogas <laughs> to mean women. Uh, and we've got a wonderful example um, that you can see here on the slide. And and again, um, still uh, in, in relation to Lexis and, and semantics, uh, Glennis was referring before to how address terms and kinship terms, such as auntie, for example, are used in, in Aboriginal English to address uh, both people who are literally your auntie, but also other people. Other people of that age where you're um, wanting to ask a question, you're not sure who they are, but you'll know who they are because you're going to approach them using a term that is something that we all know, Aboriginal English speakers. It's it's a known thing. It's part of, it is a part of Nyunga. So you would do it in Nyunga, traditional Nyunga, at which still carries today so exactly yeah oh, so the, the practice the cultural the practice, practice is, is very much there. alive and kicking and address terms such as um auntie so any of these kinship kinship terms or brother like we saw in the previous um, slides are important markers of in-group identity in aboriginal english and we should probably say as well that in aboriginal english and as well as in other aboriginal communities um, uh, who speak, you know, various different languages, there's a strong orientation to the group. And so, um, which was one of the reasons why we were um, yeah. recording okay. people in groups. Um, and the use of kinship terms of address makes it possible to index intimacy and belonging. Basically, if I call you auntie, I am assuming that it's like a reciprocal relationship. It's, of It's... it's older to younger celeste would be an auntie because i would be her auntie as in age so i would automatically know that or if celeste was aboriginal she would know to refer to me as auntie not a Glennis. lady yes or a a you've got something they will give exactly and i've never actually gone there as such you see because i am not aboriginal so i yeah. think this is a very important line as well that people both 
know about it's and respect. It's, and it's part of socialization. Like you know what to do because you're part of that group. And it's not actually put down. It's not there in no, words. People no, have not no, actually put it, but no. there are part of that L-O-R-E that are still there and very crucial to, to Aboriginal English and to doing when you're wanting to do research and respecting and keeping that culturally safe space. You must know all these things and Aboriginal English speakers actually do actually know all of this. That's... That's why they are still Aboriginal English speakers. Yes, yes. Because they're very much exactly. still into the more of the traditional where many people have seen it as less educated or broken, not talk and write. No, it's not about that. It's going, I've got to see these fellas and I don't really know in which how I'm going to talk to them. It's all of that is in their head. They know there's only one way they can really do it, but they know it's a woman. I can't go front on to her. I'll go alongside and a little bit behind because she's a bit older, so I won't go up. There's all of this was in our research. Celeste, it was happening, and when we relook at some of those things again, it is all there. It's, it's all there. And the there. other thing that we found in our corpus is the use of use as a second person plural pronoun to refer to more than one person very, very clearly. So this group orientation um, really shows quite clearly in, um, in the actual language that is used and that is present in the mm. corpus. Um, we then move on to semantic inversion, which is really productive in Aboriginal English, where terms such as wicked uh, are used uh, to mean something like great, they are wicked, they are cool. That's an actual example from the corpus. Um, and we also note here the use of the term fellas, um, which is very common in Aboriginal English, is, is the term black fella. A black okay. fellow then would be a black person. Black fellas, we can call ourselves, are you seeing them black fellas over there? Who they are. And it might be, they could be Yamaji mob or Wongo mob, another Aboriginal mob, but they'll be our mob. They're not another nationality. They're actually Aboriginal. We know they're Aboriginal, but we'll say who them black fellas is. And they could say, well, okay, that's, that's his mob there. So, we know yeah. so that's another really stereotypical sort of word, mob, right? Yeah. Mob to mean... Who said mob? Who's that group of people? Or are they family? They are together. Yeah, who are they? Are they family? Where do they come from? What's their ancestry potentially? Who do they know? And who do they live group, with? Someone will see the features or maybe no one. I think they look like... Collard mob, maybe, or Eads mob, because the eyes, okay. Oh, oh they must see. So there's always like way. a placing of people, some, which you did a, a lot of on, as yeah. well. Well, that's just automatic. You're doing that yes. with your eyes while we're just driving. Oh, we'll pull up. So let's just pull up here. Oh, okay. Can we just pull up? Yes. Yeah, we can just yes. pull up. Yes. Um, we also have the term cruel. That it functions as an intensifier. For example, here, that's cruel, scary. It's a bit like very scary, cruel, terribly, scary. Um, terribly scary. Um, and we also have in the corpus a discourse pragmatic uh, particle, ana, which is basically an utterance final tag that is used to establish common ground. It's also an ana, you fellas. Yes. So you get in the beginning, the middle, or the end, constantly going. And I, and I, if you refer back to little girl talking, first video there, and, I, and, I, and when we, and you'll hear her going flat out, but there's, you might have to slow it down a bit. Because she's doing all of this. And yes. So, so the example you can see here is an utterance final 
Anna, but yeah. of course it's it's elsewhere as well. Mm. Um, the other thing that we've written quite extensively about is that many of the episodes in the corpus that we collected are extremely dramatic and performative. And there's so much direct speech, aside repetition, expressive sounds, sound effects and motions and gestures. You saw some of that in the video we've already shared with you. But one of the features of Aboriginal English that was quite salient in the corpus is the use of quotative reckon to introduce someone's own or other's speech. So for example, here we've got Mick reckon, get up you fellas. And that is basically like saying Mick said, get up or Mick says, get up your, your fellas. So um, that are uh, there are so many different strategies for introducing um, direct um, speech as well that we found in our corpus. So just to summarize what we've presented so far, Aboriginal English is a post contact variety of English used by about 80% of First Nations people in Australia. And fortunately, Many people still erroneously view Aboriginal English as broken or deficient. We have uh, explained, however, and shown you using original material contained in our corpus, that Aboriginal English consists of unique phonological, grammatical, lexical, semantic, and discourse pragmatic features. What we haven't yet specifically referred to which you can see here in red, is that Aboriginal English is emblematic of a post-invasion Aboriginal identity. This is what Glennies was telling us about, that a lot of the ancestral Nyunga lore and culture is still uh, very much encapsulated, lives in, very much alive and kicking in Aboriginal English. And because this is the case, <clears throat> Aboriginal English can be an extremely useful tool, and it indeed is a very useful tool, in communicating important medical messages to First Nations communities. So we would like to share with you a little yarn about how we were able to use all of our linguistic insights into Aboriginal English to create original medical media in Aboriginal English. Many of you may be thinking, well, why not? Why wouldn't you create media using Aboriginal English? Well, for some reason, it had never been done yeah. before yeah. that we know of, at least for the kind of context that we're about to describe for you. And so what we would like to do, and this is very much the end of our presentation, but still we'd like to share with you um, a video that shows the kind of work we completed with the, for the Heart Foundation, with the Heart Foundation, because we believe that it's extremely important to combine linguistic description and linguistic knowledge with projects that will potentially and hopefully improve the lives of First Nations people. So... Let us quickly tell you um, the story of how this all happened. A couple of years ago, in 2020 to be exact, um, we were lucky enough to be invited to work with the Heart Foundation uh, to create some medical videos. We really didn't know exactly what they wanted, but that was the very vague sort of generic guidelines that we were given. This was an exciting opportunity because First Nations people in Australia are twice as likely to die from cardiovascular disease than non-Indigenous Australians, so twice as likely. Despite this, most medical media for First Nations people are produced in what lay practitioners usually refer to as simple English. We won't really go into what simple English no, it's is. A, it's a long yarn, that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we collaborated with the Heart Foundation to create two videos in Aboriginal English. And this was 
as we were saying before, the first time that this had taken place, at least in the context of heart um, health media. So, Glennis, did you want to share any around the video that we're about to show in oh. terms of how it was put together? Or the, I, I just think that the important thing, especially for our mob, is the messages that they, when you want to to yarn to to talk about something, it always has to be something real. If it's not real, then don't worry talking about it. So you can give ten pieces of paper, but that it, why do you want ten pieces of paper? Actually, that's what they gave, and I looked at it and went, I don't know why they want that. And I but and look, there it there are Aboriginal people who don't speak Aboriginal English, and that does not mean they're not Aboriginal. It's just that they did not grow up speaking it or they may have mixed parentage of a non-Aboriginal, whatever. So when you don't speak it and you are in a position, a power position to go, oh, yeah, well, we can do it. Some simple messages, some simple messages. No, there's no, no such thing as a simple message. There's why do you want to give the message in the first place? There's a reason. That's what yarning is. There's reasons for everything. Yeah. So And there's that, a cultural context as yes, well. So so really I guess what, what we experienced was that we were given so the very vague sort of yeah. uh, instruction of we are going to put together a video that needs to make people aware of, for example, the signs that something is wrong with their heart or the video we're about to show you is a video around you must get a heart health check because it can make a very big difference between staying alive or not staying alive. So obviously it was very important. And the stakes were very high. Yeah, and but what you, Glennis, were really good at was saying simple English will not actually work for this. You do not need to translate the Aboriginal <laughs> English script, which you no. put together yeah. into simple English, because it's in the Aboriginal English that you will connect with people and you will transmit the message that you must get your heart checked. It's not such a big deal. I've done it. You can do it too, for example. And it sounds simple, but it took it, a good 12 months. Took, and and <laughs> for, for people to understand that is, is no, you know, you know, when you have Bubby, you know, when you went in and you seen Bubby when Bubby was born, they give Bubby that needle. Our people don't want to, they do fear things they don't know. So putting too simple is offensive as yeah well. and it's not trustworthy something's not right there so that's you know that this is a cultural thing they'll go what they think we're cardi too that's too simple and that's that's that doesn't matter it, it's not important it is important yeah and language is not you know language is not language it does not just perform the role no. of communicating information as though we were machines. Yeah. Language is essentially an emblematic system where you want to feel like you belong so that you're going to pay attention. So all of these insights that are pretty much linguistics insights into just human language, we were able to really uh, bring into the creation of these materials. So let's have a look at the video. Hey, you fellas, what you doing? Wait there. I've been trying to catch up to you, eh? I had to tell you about this thing now we all got to have, okay? Fine. Sit down here and we'll have a yarn and I'll tell you all about it, innit? That heart check. They reckon we all got to have it, true. All our mob everywhere. Like, all got to have it. I'm telling you this because I've had one done, too. True, we don't like going to the doctors much, but we've got to go for this one. I was cruel frightened, too. <laughs> we all got to have this one done now. Sooner than later, or it'll be too late. It's the same like they do for our little fellas when they're just born, you know? Same sometimes when you get sick. Just the same like that one. They might ask you some things like talking, 
talking, talking about your family, your smoking, your food, your walking. And then they do this test, like blood ones for sugars and kidneys and even cholesterol. That's too much fat in your blood. And then they send it away for tests. Then they do your blood pressure one and then they listen to your heart. And then it's finished like. They're doing it now because a lot of things can make your heart crook. Especially if your family mob had a bad heart or was pretty young when they passed away. So you just got to get that heart checkup done, you fellas. See your doctor, your nurse or your health worker today and get your heart checkup done for free. Yes, so we are going to leave it there. Please feel free to contact us should you have any comments or questions. And thank you so much for your attention today. Goodbye. Bye.